Welcome to The Screen Queen, where I'll be talking about your favorite movie or your favorite TV show. You'll just have to listen to find out. Here is your host, Samantha Parrish. Hello there and welcome back to the show. As always, my name is Samantha Parrish and you are listening to your media queen, The Screen Queen. Summer is officially here. Well, in Virginia, I would say it's like hell's front porch. But the one thing that I love about the summer is I love to enjoy getting to watch the summer themed films. And it's interesting how they've aged over the years, but none better than Point Break, where a lot of changes happen to the action genre and it's not talked about enough. Point Break is directed by the amazing Catherine Bigelow, who was literally writing off of her former marriage to James Cameron and proved that she is more than just being an ex-wife to James Cameron. She made something that people didn't see coming. But another one of those things that people didn't see coming was Keanu Reeves, who would eventually make a huge killing in the action genre with speed and going on to other action films, and most notably growing up into John Wick. But Point Break isn't talked about enough in his action career, and none of everyone else is given the proper credit for this film, and that's what I'm here to do. So fasten your seatbelts, get your surfboards, and we're going to dive right into Point Break. So, as always, I like to give the plot synopsis for anyone that has never seen this film. And I believe this film has faded into obscurity, but I think you're going to find this film is a lot more familiar than you thought. The plot of Point Break follows a fresh, new FBI agent named Johnny Utah. Like, it doesn't get any more 90s than a name like Johnny Utah. And that character proves that Keanu Reeves would make a great career off of characters named John. But that's different because this is Johnny Utah and he is young, dumb, and full of cum as they say in the FBI department because you have to make that kind of writing. Anyway, he's working with another FBI agent named Pappas. Johnny ends up finding out about the theory that Pappas has about a current case in the FBI about these bank robbers called the ex-presidents. And he's deduced that the ex-presidents are surfers. So now Johnny's got to go undercover and hang ten and figure out where he can find the ex-presidents. And he finds them sooner rather than later as he's introduced to Bodhi, or as he's called, Bodhi Zafa, you know. Soon after, he is getting embroiled in their life. He loves it. Even the audience gets lost. Every time I watch this film, I kind of forget that there is a bank robbery that's going to go on at some point because of the adrenaline in this film. But now everything is tested. Is he going to do what he's supposed to do as an agent of the FBI? Or is he going to let his robber surfer buddies get away with another crime this summer? There's a lot at stake here. When you look at a plot like Point Break, it almost seems paint by numbers. There are a majority of films where you can feel that you know where the plot is going, you know where things are happening, but Point Break has that charm of not knowing what's going to happen, and I believe that's mostly to think because of Patrick Swayze being the villain. Every time I watch this movie, I forget that he's the bad guy. I get so absolved into this underground world of, well, undercover work, and with Bodhi being a part of the plot that we need to see him get arrested but you also question do we want to see him get arrested this film does a good job of being an adrenaline rush that gives you what you want yes this film does not really have the same pliability of regular procedurals but you're not here for procedurals you're here to watch keanu reeves fight patrick swayze it's nice to see a film where you can put your emotions in the front and put your logic in the back and just enjoy the film for the way it is But there is another part of this film that I do enjoy when it comes to action films is getting to see your main character strip away from the procedurals. There's films like Thunderheart and films like Reservoir Dogs where you do see someone get so immersed into this world that they're leaving the world they knew behind and getting too wrapped into it. And that's not an angle that disappoints to me. I've always enjoyed getting to see someone be challenged in their identity and 
feel conflicted that they're supposed to be doing their job, but now a personal thing got in the way. And if it's done right, it's fucking gold. And it is gold in, in this one. Even though Keanu Reeves has made a hell of a career from then on, I mean, it can be argued to say that his big break really came from uh, Youngblood, where he did show how he could be able to hold his own in a fast-paced environment. No, ironically, with Patrick Swayze back then. But there's so much about this film that feels like a time capsule for not just the 90s, but the career of Keanu Reeves. There's been so many jokes made about his mannerisms that his mannerisms now become a time capsule in itself, knowing that this would be what we're going to be introduced to for the next 30 years. And even though this film came out before I was born, it is nice to see how this film has aged for 30 years. But then there's the other stuff that's aged in this film. One of that is the hamminess within this film. There are some lines in this film that no matter how hard I look at it, I still end up not taking it seriously. It's something that doesn't hurt the film, but it doesn't make the film as serious as it should be. There are just some lines that don't even need to be said. Like, we don't have to have that. And one of them is the famous... I am an FBI agent line. Before I even saw Point Break, I knew that this was a part of the film that was constantly made fun of. And anything that I went on that had to do with movie lists, I constantly found lines from this film being made fun of. When I looked at it, I see, oh, this is a great film, but how come people are making fun of it? I heard it being made fun of more than praised. But I also have to admit, I do like the way that people make fun of this film. There is a video that exists out there that just has his line of saying, Hey man, I am an FBI agent, said so many times. And I will admit, I watched that video all the way through and it did not fail to make me laugh. But this was something that I had to think about when I would eventually watch the film. And when I did, I still took it seriously, but I also couldn't forget how this one era was made fun of, and it's kind of hard not to see. I feel that the line could have been delivered differently, but then we wouldn't have this accidental comedy goal that's been made fun of for almost 30 years. But the one part of the film that I do feel hasn't aged bad, but isn't talked about enough, and that's the performance of Patrick Swayze. The way that Patrick Swayze has existed in the action genre is... A bit of an interesting timeline. When you look at how he has gotten himself in these films, it's hard to forget that he puts his health at risk for these films. He busted his knees in Dirty Dancing. He said that Roadhouse was the most challenging project he ever did that did endanger his life at a couple points and had to go make ghosts just to get a breather. So he had to go play a dead guy to not be a dead guy. But then Point Break came along as this venture back in. So he kind of went back in his own promise. But this is the most action I've ever seen Patrick Swayze in. And it's thanks to the action direction in there. Swayze was in his fucking prime in this film. Playing the kind of character that you would have wanted to see him play at some point. Now he has gone on to go play villains after Point Break. But this is the best because this is the kind of villain that Swayze would play. He brings all that charm into this character that makes you think, maybe he's not really the bad guy. The charm of Patrick Swayze worked its way so well in this film that it challenged you into what you already knew. And they hand you everything in this film from the get-go. You know he's the bank robber. You know he's gonna rob a bank. You know Keanu has to stop him. But then you also kind of don't. Every time I watch this film, I conveniently forget that he's the bad guy because I get so immersed in the way he plays Bodhi. But there's also a hilarious thing that I found out in this film was that he never went skydiving before. And the person that showed him to do skydiving and helped him through it was the co-star Gary Busey, which, oh God, I'm gonna, ugh, it's gonna be weird having to talk about him later on. Everything in this film feels like a moment in time for Patrick Swayze that he is truly having the time of his life and the peak of his action career. But I also feel that this film does a great job for the serious moments. In all the action films that I've seen Patrick Swayze in, there's always been this 
seriousness he brought into the film. Like, you believe everything he said. One of the lines I want to cite is, and this is a spoiler, where Johnny Utah has been, quote-unquote, kidnapped into their bank robbery heist. And, and the only way to make him do it is to threaten Tyler, who is the love interest of Johnny and the former love interest of Bodie. But the way he phrases everything, that they shared time together, and that he says that she loved Johnny more than uh, she loved him. And that's a hell of a line that I think only Patrick Swayze could say in the way that I 100% get. This is a man that doesn't like that he has to do this, but he has to do this. I don't think anyone else could have done that. I know that there's been an amalgamation of different action villains that we all love for our own reasons, for their horrendous actions or their sympathy. This character is a blend of both. He's a character that I could easily see as my best friend, but then also feel conflicted that this is my enemy and those feelings are constantly fought with each other. I can't think of any other action film that does that. But I want to make a segue to talk about the female interest of the film, Tyler. Now, there's another thing that I discovered when I was rewatching Point Break is that you can tell this film is directed by a woman solely because of the way the character Tyler is created. The character of Tyler is, she's a tough bitch. She never comes across as a damsel in distress. She holds her own. Whenever she yells at Johnny Utah for anything he's doing, you know this is from a place of compassion and a place of a hard life. When it is revealed that her parents died and that becomes the way that Johnny Utah gets an in with her in you know, one of the most you know, crushing ways possible to have to use death as a leverage for a story. It, it is sympathetic when we see her soften her face a little bit that there is something underneath the tough dexterity that she has had to live with this. This isn't just, oh, she's sad about it. This is something she's thinking about every single day. And you can see it on her face with the way that the lie is made to her that Johnny Utah's parents died. It's very compelling and she doesn't get enough credit. But I also feel that Tyler doesn't get enough credit for being a sex symbol. I know it sounds kind of funny that I'm literally about to sexualize this character, but Lord Petty is hot in this film. She is so attractive in the way that she just exists. She is just tooting her own horn in life. She's going about everything. She does not give a fuck. And I love that about her character. But I also love that you don't have to see her be romantic with both Bodhi and Johnny to know that she does care about them, but she's not going to let a romance get in her way. I hate to say it, but normally some female characters exist to be the eye candy or to exist to be in danger. Tyler just exists. And I like that she's just there. She is caught in the crossfire. And you do feel bad that she is wrapped up in something that she literally is not going to see coming. In the scene that I mentioned earlier where she is shown on the surveillance footage of her being held captive, the look in her eye was so much anger and the way that she yells fuck you through her muffled mouth you knew this woman wasn't gonna go down without a fight you knew she claw bit scratched punched kicked to do anything to survive she is a surfer she is an athletic woman but you just kind of know in her character she's not gonna go down without a fight tyler is a character that you care about because she is a woman existing out in the world she holds her own she has perfect athleticism She's a character that you haven't had enough time with, but you know enough about her to know how she's able to go through every part of her life. She is validly emotional about everything. She's not an overly dramatic character. And like I said, she's not overly dramatically written as a woman because she is written by a woman. It just doesn't get not talked about enough that the most accurate female in an action film was first brought by a female director that held everything here so as much as this film is cheesy in its own moments you have a character like Tyler that kind of balances everything out so when you go back and rewatch Point Break definitely take a more observant watch of the way Tyler is characterized and know how that it's aged better than most films for how women are portrayed in in films 
I would honestly say a close second to that is Mercedes Rule from the Fisher King, and I've definitely gushed about that. So you have two prime examples of women being written correctly in the 90s. So this next part is something I have followed for a majority of my life in seeing how Point Break has aged. There's also the, um, the accusation that Point Break was stolen from. So in 2001, a little film called Fast and the Furious came out. And I'm just going to walk through the plot of that. An undercover agent that has to go into a den of car thieves. What is Point Break? An undercover agent that's going into a den of bank robbers. It's the same thing, but it's also not the same thing. I, I'm half and half on the stealing thing because I don't see a lot of the same things or elements from Point Break and Fast and Furious. But with that said, I also do not get into Fast and Furious. I don't dislike Fast and Furious. I admit there are some parts that had me giggling, but it's not my thing. I'm not a a strictly car chase kind of action girl. I gotta have some some blood, I gotta have some guns, I gotta have some punches, I, I gotta have that be the primary thing. I can't just have cars crashing into buildings. But this was on a list years ago that I saw about ripoff films where Fast and Furious was given the finger about stealing from Point Break. So, as much as I do think that there is a comparison I also feel that there is not too much of an accusation because it's not the first time that we've had a film with an undercover agent. There's going to be a dime a dozen of other films. I mean, shit, I could name stuff on top of my head like Reservoir Dogs being uh, an undercover agent with a whole bunch of um, robbers about to do a heist. Like, it's, it's a blueprint for many action films or drama films or thrillers. So it's not the first time that there has been a claim of plagiarism. It's probably not going to be the last uh, claim of plagiarism. But like I said, it just happened to be that Fast and Furious had the most in common with Point Break. That made it a very interesting coincidence. But before I move on to my next topic, uh, I do have a tiny story to share that adds into that. Uh, I have a friend named Darcy who loves the Fast and Furious franchise. Um, like, if anyone gets their names wrong, they had a nice life. Like, I pity the person that fucks up, uh, by saying they don't like Fast and Furious. I'm surprised I'm allowed in her good graces because I'm not really, uh, driven into that franchise. But when I told her that Fast and Furious was given a criticism of stealing from Point Break, she said, and I quote, No, that's impossible. Point Break had to have stolen from Fast and Furious. And I'm like, yes, a film from 1991 uh, definitely stole from a film in 2001. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. And so <laughs> uh, I've never been able to shake that conversation. I find it very funny considering like the, the way that we love certain films and what we do to live and die for them. Like I would ride and die for a Point Break like she rides and dies for Fast and Furious. All nine of those fucking movies. So I feel it would be a crime if I didn't talk about what is considered the best scene of this film. So shit hits the fan real quick. The ex-presidents are robbing another bank and it's right when Johnny and his partner Pappas are scouting out. And it just happened to be that this was the day shit hit the fan and now Johnny has to go after the ex-presidents and after a very lengthy chase... Johnny has Bodhi, who has a Reagan mask on, in his sights. And we know Johnny Utah doesn't miss. We had a whole introduction to his character about how he's a great shot no matter what. However, this thing called emotions got involved, making it hard for him to shoot the person that has become his mentor, his friend, uh, his new lease on life. That sounded a little bit romantic, but then again, it is kind of romantical. And Johnny can't shoot Bodhi and that Bodhi knows that it's Johnny Utah you see this these two come to the realization that they know that who their real identity is but still can't bring to hurt one another and Johnny Utah just expels all of his casings into the sky in the most dramatic way possible that has been 
seen as overly dramatic, but it's been honored and parodied over the years. A little British film called Hot Fuzz came out in 2007 and gave this scene another resurgence when the character Nick Frost plays uh, shows Point Break to um, Simon Pegg's character, even mimics the gun shooting in the air when uh, he's sort of getting into the emotion but also is feeding into the cheesiness. But then the moment happens within Hot Fuzz when uh, the escalation in Nick's character has him doing the same thing Keanu does. So you see how it's become honored and humored over the years. It's kind of interesting to see how Hot Fuzz has kept this movie alive. It's something that not many people notice unless you are really deep into the action genre. I guess you could say it's a real wave of emotion. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm good. I'm good. I swear. So I didn't have a proper segue for this part, but I did want to make a point to talk about Gary Busey being in the film. This has, I wouldn't say challenged me, but knowing where Gary Busey is today with his life being into um, sexual misconduct allegations, I mean, honestly, no surprise there. It's a weird thing to have to look at him in this film knowing that in the future, 30 years from then, that he would basically be the villain that we've always seen him in the fucking action films. But for the most part in this film, this is the only one I've seen where he's not a bad guy. He was the bad guy in Lethal Weapon, which ironically made a trope in action films of having an albino bad guy. But the role of Pappas being in between Lethal Weapon and Under Siege, it is tolerable. So when we look at the character of Pappas, there's not much to him. I don't know of any wives he's had. I don't know of any children he's had. All he eats, sleeps, and drinks is this case. And that's kind of a driving force for his character because he's driving the plot of the film. Because he is the background story of the film, he's the one that gives us all the information we need to know. He's handing us what we're about to see. Uh, I also like the fact that this is not really a father figure character to Johnny. It could have been easy to write him off as like this dude that uh, makes him choose in between you know, the law and in a different limelight being engulfed into a life. But Johnny can kind of think for himself. He's going to have to deal with that shit on his own. And Pacmas just keeps himself away in there. He's like, hey buddy, you handle your scandal. And that makes more of the focus within the film and he doesn't become an annoying character. I've never felt his character was annoying and that is awful to have to say that about a performance of Gary Busey considering everything about him. When you look at a face like Gary Busey, he immediately becomes unlikable. In, and of course, obviously for other reasons now he's unlikable. But at that time, he was the go-to guy for villains. And he never really changed a lot of his mannerisms. He was always this, like, tough, grit shit. And with this one, there's more of a dedication to this character that he has no ulterior motives. All he's thinking about is this case. And I like that it makes him a dedicated character. Every time I see Pappas, he just has this hunger in his eyes to get this case done. He wants uh, no more injustices to keep happening. People having the worst day of their lives because of these guys that want to just rob banks to fund their summer. As much as the film is kind of an awkward sore spot with Gary Busey, it's also a moment of time where he was tolerable at one point. That's kind of all I'll say about it. So I want to end this episode with the woman that started it all. And that's Catherine Bigelow. Catherine Bigelow is one of the names that gives me hope. I mentioned in my previous episode with Roseanne about how Roseanne Barr proved to be a woman that could put different women on television. Catherine Bigelow proved that women can direct anything. Even though we already had female directors at that point, we didn't really have one do an action film quite yet. And Catherine Bigelow showed she's got balls, man. Like, Everything in this film doesn't feel like it was directed by a woman, but then, like I said, with the whole Tyler segment, you can also tell that it was directed by a woman. It is one of the purest films I've seen, and to think that it's an adrenaline rush. 
and it's phenomenal what she has poured into and that point break is kind of like her baby that she birthed into the cinema world into the action genre and it's phenomenal so I want to end this on a piece of trivia that I just read about her that is wild to see how her career has changed now earlier I opened up with how her marriage to James Cameron did help her get into the industry, but she also did let her marriage get in the way of becoming a director. In 2010, when the Oscars were coming up, she and James Cameron were the first to be ex-spouses competing against each other in the Oscars. And this was a First for so many firsts. This was a first of first of first. This was so many firsts involved to have her and her ex husband compete, and then she won the Oscar, making her the first female director to win an Oscar. Now, that is pretty fucking phenomenal. This woman has made history. She went all the way from these bank robbing surfers, and then she would eventually go on to make. The Hurt Locker, Detroit, Zero Dark Thirty. She really found a home in the action genre, but we wouldn't have that if it wasn't for Point Break. And I think that's a pretty good point to break on. Okay. (sighs) Well, so usually this is when you find out what the next episode is going to be on the screen queen. Well, I'm here to tell you that you're not going to know for quite some time. We are fast approaching the 100th episode celebration of the Screen Queen. And I have a plan for that that requires a little bit of time. So, leading up to the 100th episode that will be airing, I had to double check the math about this because your girls did, she didn't get the best marks back in math, but well, I make a count. Within two weeks, we are going to be having the 100th episode. It's going to land on July 11th. That could have been an easier way to explain it, but this is where we're sitting at. So in between the 100th episode coming up, I'm going to be releasing episodes of Trailer Time, mostly because those are the easiest episodes to put out. I need to have a break from uh, the hectic episodes we've had recently. And when the 100th episode airs, I am going to be taking a two-week hiatus from the show. The amount of work I've done lately, I am very proud of, but it has really taxed me. And I love the show, but I know when I have to walk away from it. And I feel like that would be the time to take my two-week vacation after the 100th episode. So, with that said, y'all know what's going to be going on for the next month on the Screen Queen. If you want to catch up with me in between uploads, you can find me on my Instagram at the queen of the screen. If you want to shoot me some recommendations or if you also want to talk about the beauty of Point Break, I'm down to have that conversation. We can talk about it more than Hot Fuzz does. And if you are looking for another place to listen to your media queen, I am now available on YouTube and I've heard it's been a much easier experience to listen to me on. Uh, And... If you're interested in a little crime caper, sketchy series to add to your collection, I wrote a little book called Inglorious Inc. You can find that bad boy on Amazon, but I have it available for easy access in the description box. No bank robbery required. Well, you all take care now. Stay amazing and oh dear God, please stay cool. This is your screen queen signing off. Bye bye